So just uh, stepping back then, so how did you, like what's your background and how did you, and particularly how did you get into this kind of um, interesting world or whatever? So I've always been a tinkerer and I got it, you know, I was a puppeteer and then a school teacher and then I made videos for Make Magazine and uh, worked at Etsy and then started a hacker collective in Brooklyn called NYC Resistor. And Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, NYC Resistor is awesome. It's a, and now there's hacker spaces. You know, when we started, I think we were one of the first hacker spaces in, in this new wave of hacker spaces. And now pretty much every city, city has a hacker space. So like, and what it is is a clubhouse. And that's for, for geeks. Okay. <laughs> and we have all the tools we want and a community of folks but who are smart. But is it particularly hardware and not software hacking or both? Or? You know, every, every space is different. Ours is focused on hardware hacking okay. and making things. And, but there's other spaces that are more So like what would people focused. make there besides 3D printing stuff? You know, somebody just made something for a classroom that is basically like a telepresence robot made out of like just junk we had lying around. Okay. Cool. We have a laser cutter, so there's lots of laser cutting getting made. Uh, the laser cutter gets used like 24 seven. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, okay, so you started that and then, right. and then, um, and then how, what happened? Well, it's, you know, 3D printing is, is sort of a holy grail for tinkerers because it's not just making things, it's making something that makes things. And so we really wanted one. And we couldn't afford one, so we just started, we just started hacking things together. And you know, we started in 2006, 2007 as a hobby for fun. And then by 2009, we had one that almost worked. Mm. And so then we quit our jobs and started MakerBot, and put the pedal to the metal. I see. Um, and uh, and um, you know, right now, people have when you order one, you have to assemble it, correct? Yep. I mean, is your plan to eventually have one that is fully assembled and yeah actually that, that definitely limits the audience right potential target mo market or whatever having to assemble it yeah i mean up until now you've had to put it together actually about a week ago we made it so that you could buy one fully assembled it's the same thing just our technicians assemble it and mm -hmm. actually they give you a call and they ask you what color leds you want in it and yeah. what color plastic and then we make it and ship it out to you and they walk you through the process of getting it started because it's it's not hard, but it's definitely something new. So it's it takes a little walk. Yeah. Through. And so um, um, you mentioned that this is sort of like 1976, and you're sort of Altair or something. Like, how do you, you know, when you think about it from a business point of view, how do you, you know, I think Altair turned out to, I don't know the exact story, but they weren't the big winners in the in the PC world. Like, how yeah. do you? Do you see this, I guess, first of all, as like a movement in the same way that the PC was a movement, and there were 40 companies created and lots of, you know, and then software industries and sort of massive industry. I mean, do you think it's like that kind of scale? And uh, I guess first question and second question is if that's the case, like how do you avoid being kind of the, the, the kind of cool guys who kicked it off or helped kick it off, uh, um, you know, but then were surpassed by some like marketing wonder boy or something? Yeah, I mean, we want to be the we want to be the Apple we want to, our, our next machine to be the Apple II, not the Commodore sixty four. Okay, I think um, that was a good machine too. Yeah. It was, but then okay. it didn't go anywhere. Um, and like when we started, there there was just basically the RepRap Research Foundation, which was basically a uh, a bunch of folks making three D printers with the focus of being able to make other three D printers with their three D printers. And we decided we wanted a machine that could just make anything that would just be useful. And that's would be like, easy that's to make. there's a name if a RepRap machine is a machine yeah. that can build itself, correct? That's that's its main focus. And does yeah. MakerBot qualify as a RepRap machine? It does now. So like yeah. like a year and a half in, somebody made a make one of our users made a MakerBot. So I mean, obviously Maker you can't Bot. print the whole thing, but you print every piece of it, and then all the parts except the what we call the vitamins, which are like the nuts and bolts and metal parts, you can print on I MakerBot. See. Okay. Sorry, as you were saying about the industry. So. Yeah, so the industry is going to be, it's just going to get more and more interesting. I mean, it's actually going faster than I expected. When we started, I thought it would take like four years, five years to get to where we are now. And, you know, we're just trying to keep up. It's growing fast. So what, what in five, ten years, like, you think people, everyone will have a 3D printer in their home? You know, it's hard to imagine now, but like when microwaves came out, it was super, super exciting and thrilling to have a microwave. And you went over and watched it and you worried about sitting in front of it and stuff. And I think it's, and now it's just like boring. Like everybody has a microwave. Well, Bill Gates really... said had this, you know, it was like, it was considered radical when he said his goal was to have a PC on every desk. Right? right. And it was like, wow, that's nuts. And now of course we have like four of them or something. I mean, not, not a PC, yeah. but some computer or whatever. But... I mean, I, my, what I, one of my kind of goals is to get one in front of every kid. 
like one MakerBot per child style, you know? Because if I was 10 and I had access to a MakerBot and I could take the things that I imagined and just make them rather than having to like take things apart and mm. deal with string and stuff. But is it, is it all sort of around like kind of the fun sort of toy-like stuff? Or I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, you know, the PC I think started off, like, I don't know, I started off playing games on it. I think a lot of people who, yeah. you know, who are of our era or whatever, who had Apple IIs and things did. But then eventually you had the spreadsheet and you had all sorts of other things and that's when you really had a booming industry is when you kind of crossed over beyond the sort of just the tinkers, right? I mean, do you see that as something that like and like what would that be? Like what would it so what would be like in the in the household of two thousand twenty, you know, would you be just printing all of your silverware and not buying it anymore? Or how I mean what do you use it for? Or do you like send somebody, like you send their, I mean, I, presumably like you can have different materials and eventually you can have any material, I guess, or, uh, or? Yeah, I mean, the future looks interesting. We've got like, <clears throat> like you say, like right now, most people are using it just for their, like 95% of MakerBot use is just for satisfaction and enjoyment and puzzles and toys and stuff like that. But then there's stuff like when you have a MakerBot and, you know, we had a user whose glasses broke, so he just printed new glasses frames. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we had a user who moved into his apartment and they were out of shower curtain rings and so he printed shower curtain rings and we have we hear stories like this of people mm -hmm. just printing the things that they need and so when you have a MakerBot you have like MakerBot goggles mm -hmm. and you just start seeing the world through the mm -hmm. eyes of like well you know I need one of these rather than just instantly yeah, think go are, shopping glasses for glasses are it. interesting I guess because you can you could completely tailor them to your face in a way that you could never before right yeah like I'm I have actually like a super weird nose and you know, I always have trouble finding glasses for example or I yeah we could scan those scan your glasses in and like move them apart a little yeah bit. so that's actually how you got these people here right this is like uh, Chris Poole from Canvas. This is yep. his, his use. Because I saw him that day, and he uh, <coughs> was covered in powder. I said, "What, what happened to you?" And he said, "I was over <laughs> at MakerBot getting scanned." So, so you have this. Uh, what well, you have some a scanner there where you scan any object, and then yeah, it's a laser scan. It's a Bohemus scanner, and we basically you sit down and we cover you in cornstarch. Mm -hmm. Well, just that your mostly your hair because the the laser doesn't like to see dark things, so we have to kind of lighten it up with some yeah. with some powder. 